I've served on the board of directors with the Workplace Bullying Institute. Uh, they're out of Bellingham, Washington at this time. They started in Benicia, California. And you'll be able to find them online. You'll also be able to find the Zogby International Polling Reports. Uh, this problem has affected at least 30% of our American workforce. It's uh, invasive in the workforce. Um, my, my favorite comment is, bully for America and never give a sucker an even break. And we're destroying ourselves with this. It's extremely expensive. Uh, in terms of dollars. And the dollar signs are what are listened to perhaps by the politicians. And we, uh, I mentioned earlier that I've been in strong support and I've been lobbying in California, my home state of Illinois, and the state of Wisconsin to make it actionable. So when a person is damaged uh, psychically in the line of work, rendered disabled by post-traumatic stress disorder, which is 23% of the women who leave the workforce. The data is slightly smaller for men. But there, uh, so many of us are diagnosed with PTSD. I was myself immediately upon leaving work. My injury was so profound that it has affected my speech. I sound good now. If I'm under any sort of a threat, I will start to stutter, slur, I'll get a vibrata, and I will coil on the right side of my body. Uh, my injury was sustained 15 years ago. This is a conversion disorder. At the time of that injury, medical science did not realize that there was a genuine impact too much cortisol, too much adrenaline in your system when you're under attack for a long period of time can render you with brain damage. There is a direct effect on the hippocampus of your brain, on the amygdala of the brain. There is a lot of research going on. And it's my contention that once we're able to put this into data, we're able to photograph it with conclusive diagnostic help, we'll be able to get this passed, that this is a genuine physiological injury to the human body. You, I don't know where you house your brain when they tell you it's all in your head. I keep mine inside my head and I like to attach it to the rest of my body through my neck. And there's a direct reaction if you mess with my brain, something happens to the rest of me. This is where a lot of repetitive injuries come from. If you're sitting there typing all day and you're stressed like crazy through here, you're going to bound up those muscles and you're going to hurt yourself. You're going to end up with carpal tunnel syndrome, not just because you're doing the same thing over and over, but because you're doing it under severe stress. Okay. Now, um, I want to mention to you that you can stand by and watch a fellow worker be traumatized in this fashion, and you will not come away unscathed. A witness of abuse is a victim of abuse. When I left work, seven of my former colleagues would gather together in the school library to pray at 7 o'clock each day so they could make it through the day. The perpetrator that targeted me was David Miller. I have no hush clause on a workers' comp case that I ba battled for seven years. He was a school superintendent. He was misappropriating funds and practicing all sorts of corruption. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's and he was getting by with it. Yeah. And when he was reported to the appropriate authority, the Commission on Teacher Credentialing, they couldn't figure out who he was. There are only 1,000 school districts in the state of California. It's my conjecture. They pocketed the file, and it was the complaint was from myself and the woman he targeted at the next district. He has a string of victims up and down the state of California. Every school district he went into secretly threw him out. Eventually, after contract, 
your last year on the job, go to your office, your job is to find a new job. They would have had to have paid him $200,000 to leave because he had contractual language if they fired him. And this is going on. The commission is complicitous. Kathy Carroll, who was a whistleblower for the commission, a lawyer inside, she said that they'll hang a teacher but cover up real fast when an administrator steps out of line, and the same thing's happening in hospitals. Yeah. Joint Commission has asked hospitals to include something that they might be doing to write policy to deal with this. And it's not happening because there is no punishment for the perpetrators. Oh, they we write policy, they just don't follow They it. don't follow it. They don't follow it. And the same thing has happened in the city of, Sac uh, uh, the city of San Francisco. We have 40 cities up and down, cities and counties up and down the state of California that have written proclamations, resolutions, recognitions. I've got a signature here from Antonio Villagrosso recognizing the California Healthy Workplace Advocates and the fact that the third week of October is Freedom From Bullying Week. But what is happening? Because a lot of the perpetrators are simply put under the rug or they're moved to another uh, department. Um, we worked with Senator Yee this spring trying to get a bill passed that would out those that were practicing malfeasance, those of us who are whistleblowers. I'm a whistleblower. We know a lot of whistleblowers out there, yes. Anytime there's a pile of money, you've got a chance somebody's stealing it, somebody's shaving it on the side. And if you're the person that's working anywhere near accounts receivable, that money can trickle right out the door or purchases, or you're building a new school, or you're doing Medicare filings in a medical system, you know, or you're doing inventory in a private industry. It's happening everywhere. Many of us are targeted as whistleblowers, and we never puckered up and blew a thing. We knew too much. And they come after us to dispose of us because we pose a threat. We pose a threat because we're good workers. We pose a threat because we're English teachers who write and talk effectively, even when they stutter. We are people who are ethical. The average target is outspoken, ethical, good people skills. The legislators want to brush us off as disgruntled malcontents, somebody that's got a bone to pick with somebody. That's not it at all that most of the targets, the profile of the target that comes out of the research done at the Workplace Bullying Institute, we're the best workers. We're the people you want for your teachers, for your nurses. In 2004, when he was campaigning to be the senator from the state of Illinois, I met Barack Obama, and I touched him. That's a great man. And I said to him, teachers and nurses are being bludgeoned in the field. And he said to me, you're right. This is a hot button issue, and we need to do something about it. And I said, there's a group of us nationally that are trying, and we have been. We, I've been trying since 95. The Institute's been trying since 99. Uh, the Institute has had way over 400 different media contacts. People know what's going on, but it's a dirty little secret. And the, those who target get a fix. They love it. It's enjoyable. Yeah. And if they dispose of you, they'll find a new target. Mm -hmm. That's the way they'll practice. Yeah. And we promote them. Mm -hmm. We have a culture that thinks that's OK, a culture that thinks that's productive. And I'm telling you, social engineering is very, very slow. But I will die trying. There, Santa Cruz has a respect in the workplace survey out on the internet. There's something wrong in Santa Cruz if they're sending this out and trying to find out. They talk about bullying here. The city of San Francisco called it mobbing. It's the same thing. Mobbing is a European term. And by the way, the language in that went through HR through Mr. Sandoval and Tommy Amiano was in the audience at the time. He was fired. He was bouncing around the room. And we were shocked that there were boards of, members of the Board of Supervisors that didn't want this language in there. They wanted to continue to perpetuate targeting. And they say that there's no definition for this. It's repeated health harming, mistreatment, 
that destro destroys the activity of work and injures the target or targets. And it can be caused by one or more people. The grand jury investigated, do you know in California we can go directly to the grand jury without going to a district attorney? And a grand jury will consider whether or not to investigate. We're the only state in the union like that. But most of us don't know this until we're involved in something. The people in Ventura County went to the grand jury and tried to get their interest. And they didn't succeed, but the issue was bullying. So this is happening up and down our state. There's a warehouse Steve brought my attention to, or maybe I found it through my Illinois people. There's a warehouse in the, for Walmart, distributors of the warehouse, down in Los Angeles, and there's one in Chicago. They're working in 120 degree heat. They're trying to unionize. It's against the National Labor Relations Act to go after somebody for trying to unionize, but they do it and they get by with it because it's up to the target to prove it. And they'll have somebody stop for hours a day, do everything, nothing else but lift 100-pound boxes until their back is so bad they can't work. And these people are saying, we're going on strike. And if these people go on strike, we're talking about a huge, massive food supplier in the United States that comes to a grinding halt, and there won't be milk in those, wall, in those Walmart stores. So I'm really cheering for them. I almost hope they do this just to bring to attention what's going on. The Chicago teachers have workplace bullying language in their contract. In 2009, I was able to get, no, sorry, 2010, get our bill to make it actionable to go after perpetrators. I was able to get it through the Illinois Senate with the help of Jonathan Lackland of the Illinois Association of Minorities in Government. And it was tabled in the lower house. And it was t we went back in uh, 2011, same thing happened. Uh, Democratic controlled lower house labor committee put tabled us, which means killed our bill. Even though we passed their committee, their leadership wouldn't let us back onto the floor for a floor vote. And I believe it's because of what was brewing in, in Chicago. I don't know, but I believe it's because Rahm Emanuel was coming with the reputation of a bully and had intention of swinging an ax. They started putting non-educators in principal's jobs in Chicago. And they started trashing teachers right and left. And that's why Karen Lewis and the Federation of Teachers I, in Illinois, I had a lot of help from the Federation of Teachers. I didn't get any help from the National Education Association, which is the IEA in Illinois, until the last minute right before the vote. And then some strange things happened to my witness in Illinois concerning the IEA. Right after it happened, he got a phone call from somebody he hadn't heard of for two years because he dared to testify. He dared to speak the truth. They don't like people that talk about the truth. They don't like them a bit. So there is a lot going on. Tom Amiano also got a bullying bill through, it was signed today. It went in right into the legislature today. Student rights, bullying. And it, now with your case, if, if you wanted to, it would be ex post facto. This was passed after your, that child was set upon, which is an assault. There should be a, a, a police report filed by the child for that. I can't, that's surreal to me that actually happened. Um, his bill, of course, there are children that are being targeted in our schools, not, be, they don't even know if they're gay. There just might be a guy who's effeminate. Um, so this addresses that issue. But Amiano is, is key to this fact, and we're trying to get him or Leland Yi, who is a child psychologist uh, originally, we're trying to get a legislator to take this forward. They're afraid. And you know who they're afraid of? The Chamber of Commerce. What? They're terrified of the Chamber of Commerce. That's big corporate money, much of which comes from outside of the United States of America. It's not even American money. 
It's these, it's these corporate, global, international corporations that are funding this. And they are telling the legislators, because the plutocrats buy the, the elections in this nation now, and they're telling them that they won't give them money or they won't give their party money. There are a lot of times a legislator has a heart to take this forward. His leadership won't let him. They simply won't let him. Now, we do have a few brave ones throughout the United States. A young woman named Kelda Helen Royce in Wisconsin who wanted to make this the flagship of her career and to get this law passed. And if we were able to pass this law, the, the repercussions would be astronomical. The savings of workers' compensation would be astronomical. The amount of whistleblowers who could literally tell the truth in the United States of America, they could talk. And then if they were hurt with retaliation, which has been defined by the United States Supreme Court over the last two years, finally it's in the lexicon of, of, the, uh, of the U.S. government now, if, if, they, if they suffered retaliation, they could sue. And they wouldn't sue the school district necessarily. They wouldn't sue the corporation necessarily or the hospital. They would sue the guy that did it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times... 75% of the time, according to our data, it is done by the person in the position of power. Who is that? That would be the boss. A lot of times it's middle managers that are being hammered by the higher ups. Like this principal you're talking about, sounds like she's got the heat on her. Maybe she was putting MLK as a form of punishment, or we're going to test your wings here. And that sounds like somebody who's almost cooked herself because you can easily fire. I, I don't have any sympathy for it. I don't, you know, get me wrong there. It's just if you start looking, you get these, we call it a bad barrel. That's a bad, corrupt basket of nasty in a work organization. And the rot, I mean, you can take one rotten apple in a barrel, but you know, you got a bad barrel. Then our recommendation is to find a new job before you end up with post-traumatic stress disorder. So unless you can break through this, and Steve is right, it's only by organizing as workers and as human beings. This is the golden rule. Do unto others. And if 3% of it, according to the data that comes from Workplace Bullying Institute, if 3% of the American population has a narcissistic personality disorder, we can deal with that. But they, they get cronies, and they take on another 7 to 10%. And once that crony does something, the perpetrator owns them. They did bad, and they know they'll turn on them. They usually do turn on them in the end. But you're, you're long gone after that. So the, that day that we spoke in San Francisco, they wanted to send to HR the language to see if it was okay with HR. Well, HR works not really for the people that uh, our underling, you know, we a lot of times we want to go up the chain of command and we start with HR. Yeah. HR reports right away, and oftentimes the abuse hap that really starts to happen. Unions don't always, it depends on the union, but they d don't want to get involved in it if it's not written into the language of the labor yeah. contract. Right. That's the only way they can genuinely attack what's going on. Uh, otherwise, they'll just sort of shine you on and see if there's sort of a grievance procedure. Just like going to an attorney, if, you, if that attorney can prove discrimination based upon your membership of a protected class under Title VII of the 64 Civil Rights Amendment, then you've got a case to go forward with as long as you've got other members of that class that are willing to speak up and suffer possible retaliation. So, uh, and then they could sue for retaliation. Uh, and it, I don't want to preach sue happiness. I see people walk off, more people walk away from litigation than ever take it on. And only 3% of cases are ever deemed to be frivolous lawsuits. They get thrown out by the courts. I had a civil discrimination case that was thrown out after seven years on a technicality by the only sitting civil judge in Yolo County that needed to clean his desk. My mama was dying of leukemia. I wanted to be with her. 
I had, I finally said, you know, this, this is enough. But I did prevail after six and a half years in workers' comp. I couldn't today not thank you to Bill 863. And I wrote to Jerry Brown, and I wrote to, to Steinberg, Daryl Steinberg, and I said, this, you know, this is bad. And, and you are leaving the people who've been bullied in the workplace completely defenseless. There's no recourse under the workers' comp law. I got a telephone call from Ted Gaines' office and a letter from Daryl Steinberg's office. So they're running scared. It's taken a whole decade. I've talked to Daryl Steinberg. I've talked to Jerry Brown. I've talked to Ted Gaines' office. There's no way a Republican like Ted Gaines is going to do anything about this because he's afraid of the Chamber of Commerce. That, corp that is a lobbying organization to protect corporations. That's all that is. And when they talk about small businesses, they're talking about 300 people and less. 300. That doesn't sound like mom and pop down in the corner, does it? And those corporations break into these tiny little corporations so they can call themselves small businesses and get all kinds of perks, tax evasion, and so on and so forth. So the business community has it railroaded. And we, this is what it's come to. And we do have to unite, and we do have to talk about it. It is going on. I can't tell you the people that I, we talked to in the Capitol building that closed the door and just, they start crying because that is a house of meanies. They all bully each other. And one of them said to me the other day, you know, we just go along to get along so we can get to the end and get our pension. Uh -huh. And I said, you know, somebody has to run the outside of the herd. Somebody has to speak up. Somebody has to be brave. Somebody has to talk about it. Well, we talk about it. We call it bullying. It's immoral. It might be within the parameters of the law. It's perfectly okay to harass a human being in the workplace, to break them, to destroy them, as long as you're not doing it because they're a member of a protected class. Or you, the average white man, no defense whatsoever. But if you take a black woman on black woman or a white woman on a white woman, go at it, girls kill each other. It doesn't matter because they can't sue you. Not unless one of them's really old and the other's really young. Or one of them was born in a foreign country and the other one was not. You know, or one of them practices a, a strange religion. And that's another strange thing. We were getting through the Illinois situation and along come the far right Christian evangelicals who said, nope, Expressions of religion cannot be used as a form of bullying and other forms of First Amendment expression. Well, the First Amendment didn't need protection in any bill. It's the law of the land. What they wanted to do was to be able to harass people at work because they might be gay. And I was told yesterday there's a principle in the Sacramento area. Every time an out-of-the-closet lesbian teacher comes into his office, he pulls his Bible out of his drawer and sets it on his desk. Now, if that's not bullying, I don't know what is. And if you're going to protect religious expression that way, then I get to write petitions to have Susan fired. I get to have meetings in the lunchroom at lunch and, and about Susan. And I get to run the halls and say, Susan's terrible at work. Let's destroy her because that's protected by the First Amendment. So where do we draw the line? When do we, how often do we use the First Amendment to be cruel to one another? That's not what it was written for. The resolution for you folks, you can find it on our website, which is bullyfreeworkplace.org. And it's on there. And there's a videotape of uh, Linda spoke that day, I spoke that day. So the one that, that was just passed today, that strictly addresses children? That's, that is uh, AB9, California AB9, it'll pop up right away. So it's just for the children, not for the teachers? Uh, that's right, but you know what? The uh, John Vasconcelos in 2002, uh, was able to get through the School Safety Act, and it says that every person, child, uh, secretary, my favorite people in the school were, God bless the secretaries in our schools, uh, uh, the teachers, the custodians, everybody ha deserves a safe, emotionally safe working environment. It's, it's in the law, and it says right there in that law, no bullying.
Now, how do you define it? Repeated health harming mistreatment that disrupts the normal flow of activity and injures the target or targets. That's what it is. We, they taught me that in kindergarten. <laughs> So what are, you, what are you finding people are arguing against the anti-bullying? Too many lawsuits in the workplace. That's it. That's it. Okay. It's going to cost money. That's it. It's a job killer. It's killing jobs. It's driving up costs. 